Now, you're in for a really special treat tonight. Fortune Magazine recently named Peter Diamandis as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. Diamandis is the founder and executive chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation, which leads the world in designing and operating large-scale incentive competitions. He's also the executive founder and director of Singularity University, which is a global learning and innovation community that's using exponential technologies to tackle the world's biggest challenges and build a better future for all of us. Now, as an entrepreneur, get this, Diamandis has started over 20 companies in the areas of longevity, space, venture capital, and education. He's also a co-founder of Bold Capital Partners, which is a venture fund with over $250 million investing in exponential technologies. Now, Diamandis, if that wasn't enough, he's also a New York Times best-selling author of two books, Abundance and Bold. He earned degrees in molecular genetics and aerospace engineering from MIT and holds an MD from Harvard Medical School. Peter's favorite saying, love this, is the best way to predict the future is to create it yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, your closing keynote for today's LiveWorks 19 is about to kick off right now. I need you to give the loudest, warmest welcome and bring out to the stage Dr. Peter Diamandis. I am so jealous of that jacket. Wow, let's talk about exponential times. So it's a pleasure to be here. You guys having a good night? Good day? Awesome. I want to talk about exponentials and digital transformation. And there are two sub-themes I want to share that I hope you're excited about. The first is that the future is much better than you think. Despite all the negative news, we're heading towards a world where each and every one of us is empowered to change the world, to solve problems, to create the future we desire. The second truth is that the future is much faster than we think. So as I think about this, we truly are living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. Right? If you realize how powerful each of us are, the access to capital, to computation, to knowledge, to manufacturing, there really is no challenge that the right mind and passion cannot solve. It's also true that I don't believe any of us truly understand how fast the world is changing. You know, literally the addition of four billion new minds that we'll talk about, more capital than any time ever in human history, computation, cloud, quantum computing, all of these things are converging to cause the rate at which technology is accelerating to accelerate itself. So the challenge is that all of us evolved in a very different world. Our brains, 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion synaptic connections, that is every thought, everything you've ever learned, evolved for this world. It evolved for a world that was local and linear. Back then, 100,000 years ago, the only thing that affected you was within a day's walk. Right? Nothing changed in millennium, millennium, or century to century. Things were pretty much constant. Right? The, la the life of your great-great-grandparents and your life was the same. Today, the world is anything but that. Today, the world is global and exponential. Things are not changing decade to decade or year to year. They're changing month to month. Something happens in China or India, you know about it seconds later, computers know about it microseconds later. We're living during an age that is global and exponential. But our brains are not designed to perceive that. So if I were to graph it, it looks like this. This red line is all of us. It's our politicians, it's our children, it's our board members, it's our clients. We've not had a hardware or software upgrade in two million years. It's been a while. But that yellow line is computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain, all these exponentials that are doubling in power year to year. And the difference between that red line and that yellow line is either stress or opportunity. If you're the 
CEO of a Fortune 500 company and some kid in the garage who just literally displaced your, your primary product, it's stress. If you're the kid in the garage, it's opportunity. So I want to bring that concept home with two stories. Uh, the first is one I opened my last book, Bold, with. And it's the story of Kodak. So I want to take you back to 1996. Kodak is at the top of its game. It's got a brand like you could not buy. You know, and you'd have to go out and buy your film, take the photos, and you'd pay for all of them to be developed, and you'd hope that one photo came out. What most of us don't realize is that 20 years earlier, in Kodak's lab, a guy named Steven Sesson, a technologist, had come up with the first digital camera. Now, when, you can imagine when Steven Sesson brought it into the boardroom and says, here it is, the future of Kodak. It takes 0.01 megapixel images in black and white on a tape drive that the board was like sort of not impressed. Now, here was the problem. They said two things. They said, first of all, we only do high resolution, beautiful imagery. And the second thing is what killed them. They said, our profit center is in paper and chemicals. Now, that's true, but that's not why George Eastman founded the company 100 years earlier. He founded the company in order to preserve people's memories. And when a better technology, digital cameras, came along to preserve memories, Kodak didn't jump on it. And unfortunately, a few decades later, they go into bankruptcy. In the same year, 2012, that Kodak declares bankruptcy, another company, also in the digital preservation of memories, called Instagram, gets acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. But they've got 13 employees. And I've given this moment in time when a linear thinking company gets displaced by exponential technologies a name. I call it the new Kodak moment. Now, when Instagram got purchased by Facebook for a billion dollars, people laughed at that price. But today, it's worth $100 billion on their balance sheet. This is what happens when you hop onto an exponential growth curve. So here it is, that yellow line falling off a cliff is film photography, and that red line is your digital happy pics, trillions of them. And we're going to see this over and over again, where an old-style technology or business model is getting you know, disrupted and displaced by a digital transformation. Here's another example, if you guys remember a Blockbuster. Right? So here's Blockbuster, again, falling off that, that cliff. And here comes Netflix. So Reed Hastings starts Netflix in 1999. And he has a better way of delivering videos. It's on a, you know, a DVD through the post office. And there are two points in the slide. The first is, look what happens when he jumps onto an exponential growth curve, going from the post office to broadband, from $2 billion to $150 billion over the course of eight years. Right, this is the kind of growth you can experience when you actually implement a digital transformation. That green dotted line is even more important. It's December of 2008. And for the second time, Blockbuster gives up the opportunity to buy Netflix. So I want to read you a quote from the earnings call. It says, basically, Netflix is not on the radar screen in terms of competition. I mean, how much more wrong could you be? <laughs> and so there's a challenge. When you're at the top of your game and you're sitting pretty, it's very tempting to stay there, to focus on the paper and chemicals profit margin, or to say, no, they're wrong and we're right. And ultimately, it's really about questioning and not defending your position especially when every single industry is going to be reinvented this decade. I'm clear about two things. One, every industry, every company is going to have a transformation of some type this next decade. And the second is, we're going to create more wealth in the next 10 years than we have in the entire past century. How fast can things change? We're living through this right now. So these are retail companies circa 2006, Sears and Nordstrom's and Macy's and Best Buy and Target. Down at the bottom is Amazon. Now, I want you to imagine going to the CEOs of these companies and saying, guys, here's the deal. This Amazon company is going to eat your lunch. And can you, you know, even fathom what the CEO or the chief business officer would have said? said Amazon? I mean, they're an online book retailer. What do you mean going to eat our lunch? But of course, it's been extraordinary, right? It's, you know, 
these companies have dropped 90%, 70%, 60%, and here's Amazon plus 3,000%, right? And this morning, it's over $900 billion in valuation. So this kind of disruption out of right field is not a fluke. It's going to become the norm. You literally need to be constantly reinventing yourself or you're moving backwards. So the challenge is that any one of these companies have amazingly smart people. But the ability to go from I've got an idea to I run a billion dollar company overnight is moving faster than any time ever in human history. Right? There's no way to go and explain how Chad Hurley starts YouTube on his credit cards and sells it to Google for $1.6 billion 18 months later. You can't go to you know, the CEO of Hertz or Enterprise and explain how five guys without buying any cars you know, literally disrupted half of the rental car and taxi business. And why didn't Hyatt or Intercontinental or Hilton come up with Airbnb, right? Why didn't someone inside the organization say, how do we double the number of rooms we have without spending a dollar? It's about asking the right question. Check this out. This is an eye chart. I want you to just look at the logos. On the far left is 2011. On the far right is 2015, and each of these are billion-dollar unicorns. What you should take away from this is the rate at which experimentation and value creation and new companies are coming online is exploding. Your competition is no longer the multinational overseas or the competition that's been for the last 50 years. It's one of you or someone in Silicon Valley or Silicon Alley, wherever it might be, coming up with a crazy idea. So when I'm in the boardrooms of a lot of the Fortune 500 companies, my motto is the following. The day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. Let me stop one second. The day before something was truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. If it wasn't a crazy idea, it wouldn't be a breakthrough. It would be an expected incremental improvement. So the question is, where inside your organization are you trying crazy ideas? Right? Where's your crazy idea department? And if you're not trying crazy ideas, backing crazy ideas, and you're stuck in incrementalism, and that's a challenge. So what does exponential growth feel like? I'm talking about exponential growth. Many of you are living it, creating it, being part of it. So at the end of the day, I mentioned earlier, we are linear thinkers. Take 30 paces, one, two, three, four, five, I'm 30 meters away. Take 30 exponential steps, and we're an exponential to simple doubling, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. I'm not 30 meters away. In 30 doublings, I'm a billion meters away. Put differently, I've gone 26 times around the planet, which is why when you miss that exponential growth curve, you're a Kodak or a Blockbuster. So the question is, how do you stay on top of this? And we'll talk more about that. All of this is driven by Moore's Law. You guys are familiar with this. This is Gordon Moore. Starts Intel in the garage, as it should, in 1958. By 1965, Gordon Moore publishes a paper, and he says, you know, we've noticed something at Intel. The number of transistors on a piece of silicon has roughly doubled every 12 to 18 months. And then he said something else, and it's likely to continue. And it has for 50 years, and we call it Moore's Law. I want to give you a visual representation of what this looks like, because it's pretty shocking. So this is their first proof of concept you know, desktop integrated circuit. It's two transistors, about a centimeter feature size, back in 1958. This is what they start the company on. Let's fast forward a few decades. 1971, this is Intel's first commercial product, the Intel 4004, 2,300 transistors, about a buck each. Now fast forward to last year, this is their core i9 processor. Over 7 billion transistors, less than a millionth of a penny each. It's a 27 billion fold price performance increase. I have no idea how to even conceive of what something is 27 billion fold is like. But let me show you another way to look at this. Back in the 1950s, this is a 5 megabyte hard drive. 120,000 bucks. And if you happen to have your cargo airline, you can move it from location to location. Now, we noticed when this happened, right? When a few decades later, now it's 128 megabytes, 25 times more memory, 1,000 times cheaper. 
But did we notice when this happened? When nine years later, right on schedule for Moore's Law, now it's a thousand times more memory for the same price. But it doesn't stop there, right? Because now it's a terabyte for something you can lose in your pocket. And Ray Kurzweil and I are investors and advisors to a company that's focused on nanotechnology memory with the vision of putting all of Google's data centers on a sugar cube. Right? It's not slowing down. 10 trillion fold price performance volume increase. This is from Ray Kurzweil's book, The Singularity is Near. This shows computational power that you can buy for $1,000 between 1900 and today. Now, I want you to notice two things. Number one, how smooth this curve is. Right? There's no one predicting where it should go next. It's faster computers being used to build faster computers to build faster computers. The second thing is, for all of you who are remembering your high school math, this is plotted on a log scale. And an exponential on a log scale should be a straight line. But it's curving upwards, which tells us the rate at which it's accelerating is accelerating. And it's likely to continue. And if it does, what you get is the following. In 2023, four years from now, the $1,000 computer that you go down to Best Buy and purchase is now computing at the rate of the human brain, 10 to the 16 cycles per second. 25 years later, now $1,000 buys you the computational power of the entire human race. Right? Now your kid's homework gets really easy. <laughs> so you know this. You're living it here at LiveWorks. This is a lot of what PTC's vision and impact is about, that faster, cheaper computers are driving all these exponentials. Sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain, all of these technologies are getting faster and more powerful and more capable as computational power increases. And it used to be that you could be an expert in any one of these, but that's changed. It's now the combination of two, three, or four of these. It's the convergence of these technologies that are creating brand new business models. My next book that comes out in January is called The Future is Faster Than You Think, and it's all about convergences of these technologies disrupting every single industry, finance, insurance, entertainment, healthcare, education, transportation, every single industry will not be the same a decade from now. And it's not the technology that excites me, it's the business models that are going to come out of this. So the second part I want to talk about is how these technologies are transforming what used to be scarce into abundance. And for me, this is a story of uplifting humanity, a story in which we're going to be able to meet the needs of every man, woman, and child on this planet. So I talk about the 60s when I teach at Abundance 360 and Singularity University, that whatever you digitize enters a period of slow, deceptive growth. Right? So that first Kodak digital camera was 0 0.01 megapixels. The next year was 0 0.02, then 0 0.04, then 0 0.08. To the board of Kodak, it all looked like zero. Until 30 doublings later, when it's a billion times better, and it destroys film photography. So after disruption occurs, what we're seeing is dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization. Let me slow that down. Dematerialization is this, right? 20 years later, all of these things fit in your pocket. It's why Radio Shack isn't around anymore. And if you're inside a company and you're not focusing on dematerializing your products and services, you're missing the opportunity because someone else will. And when you dematerialize, you mix it ones and zeros, the, the cost of replication is near zero, the cost of transmission is near zero, and the implications is demonetization. That we're reducing massively the costs of services and products across the globe. Now, the advantage of dematerialization and demonetization is democratization. That you can now be a college kid or an entrepreneur in your dorm room and reach a billion people in Africa. Right? You have to, have to be Mutar Kent at Coca-Cola or Jeff Immelt at GE to reach that many people. But today you can. You, every one of us, can impact the world. It's really a matter of having the passion and the dedication to do that. Let's talk more about scarcity into abundance. What would you think of as more scarce than a perfect diamond, a six or eight carat perfect diamond? 
There's a friend of mine who runs a company in Silicon Valley called the Diamond Foundry. He's got a machine about the size of a refrigerator. In one end comes methane, electricity, and out the water, and water. Out the other end comes perfect diamonds. Six, eight, ten carats. How big would you like it? Would you like imperfections or color? You can add those things. You can also manufacture diamonds that look like this. So what used to be scarce is becoming abundant. And so what do you think of as scarce in your life? Energy? No way. Water, healthcare, learning, money, time, expertise, all of these things are becoming more and more abundant. And if you're building a company or thinking in a mindset of scarcity, you're going to be sorely disrupted. Let me share a few examples. It used to be that we would go out onto the open oceans and kill whales to get whale oil to light our night skies. Right? Then we ravaged mountainsides for coal. Then we started drilling kilometers under the seafloor and kilometers sideways to get oil. But we live on a planet that is bathed in 8,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species. Energy is massively abundant. It's just not all in a usable form yet. But that's changing. We're hitting all-time high lows in solar at the same time that coal is getting more and more expensive. Coal's not going to die for any other reason. It's going to be displaced economically. It's going to be the unwise choice. It's already dead. It just doesn't know it yet. So the numbers are impressive, right? In Abu Dhabi this year, unsubsidized, 2.42 cents per kilowatt hour in solar. In Chile, we hit 2.1 cents. The prediction is under a penny per kilowatt hour in the next decade. We're heading towards an all-electric economy. This is, of course, we need batteries. Batteries have been improving at a 20% consistent price per year. I just came back from Israel visiting this company, StoreDot. Their technology is about charging your car to a 300-mile range in five minutes. Right? All the major auto manufacturers are investing at this point about $100 billion in electrifying their entire fleets. Why? Because countries are saying no more internal combustion engines. We've hit peak internal combustion engine production. From here, it's electric. So one of the big things happening that I hear no one speaking about is this. We're heading towards an age of communication abundance that's going to transform the world in the next five years in a way that I don't think any of us truly can appreciate. You all know this year is the beginning of deployment of 5G. It's a big deal, right? We're going from 100 megabits on your 4G phone to 10 gigabits, you know, and it's going to spread like kudzu over all of the lands. But besides 5G, we're also seeing a deployment of Google Loon, which Alphabet spun out the Loon. We're seeing OneWeb with 900 satellites, which already started to launch their first satellites, Greg Weiler and his team there. But besides that, you've got Starlink beginning, right? 12,000 satellites. And then Jeff Bezos with another 3,000 satellites from the Kupier constellation. We're about to cover every single meter of the planet with bandwidth. Not like I came online at 9600 baud on AOL, right? We're talking about literally transforming the planet. So in 2017, half the planet was connected. 3.8 billion people had access to the internet. In the next four to six years, we're talking about connecting every single human on the planet at 100 megabits to a gigabit connection speed. So what happens when four billion new consumers come online? It's a massive marketplace. If you're not thinking about that long tail and how you serve it, you're missing the point. And do you think these four billion people are all going to want to go to a real estate broker or an insurance broker or an ATM or anything physical? They're all going to want every product and service digitally on their device, on the blockchain, available nearly for free. It's a long tail. And I talk to CEOs and say, well, that's not my marketplace. I'm in the US. I'm in Europe. I don't care. When entrepreneurs begin to serve these 4 billion people and do it better and cheaper, they'll move into New York. They'll move into Europe. And then 
you're out of luck. What do these four billion people want to create and consume and desire? They've never uploaded or downloaded anything. This represents tens of trillions of dollars flowing in the global economy. I cannot, I cannot be more excited about something. It's a massive marketplace. And all of these people are going to have access to quantum computing on the cloud. They're going to have access to AI in the cloud, 3D printing on the cloud. We're about to see this massive uptake in innovation like we haven't seen before. As 4 billion new entrepreneurs who have been entrepreneurs to survive start coming online. And it's not just people, right? You're here, you know this. It's about things coming online. It's about the IoT and the IOE, right? Whatever numbers you want to believe, it's still pretty extraordinary. 50 billion connected devices by the end of next year, a trillion sensors. Go forward 10 years, 500 billion connected devices, 100 trillion sensors. We're heading towards a world in which you're literally going to be able to know anything you want, anytime you want, anywhere you want. What do I mean? In a world where there are sensors every place, you can start to ask questions like you've never thought of before. Like, you know, ask your AI, what's the average spectral color of a man's you know, blazer on Madison Avenue today? And you can know the answer. And does it correlate to an ad campaign any time in the last month? We're heading towards a time of extraordinary knowledge and data. All right, let's jump into the field of transportation abundance. Here's Larry and Sergey and Eric behind Google's autonomous Prius. When Sebastian Thrun won the DARPA Grand Challenge in circa 2005, Larry hired Sebastian and said, build autonomous cars here at Google. And he did. And it's been extraordinary. And you have to understand, when, when Larry went and started talking to the automotive manufacturers about his vision of autonomous cars back you know, 10 years ago, what do you think they said? That's crazy. No one's going to ever want that. It's, you know, of course, they want to feel the, the wheel and the power. And every major auto manufacturer has got their autonomous electric play. So the question is, how fast is this going to change our world? And I think the answer is pretty fast. Because an autonomous electric vehicle is five times cheaper than you owning a car. And it gives you back an hour or two hours of your day. And it allows you to live an hour from where you work so you can sleep or meditate or play games. And because you live an hour from where you work, you get twice the house or three times the house for the dollar. And you've got a beautiful backyard. So how fast are people going to want to adopt this technology? Well, let's take a look at this. This is the year 1904. The streets of New York, all horse and buggy, save for a couple of cars, right? This is a very bespoke industry, automobile manufacturing back then. But there was an environmental problem in New York in 1904. It was the stench of horse manure and horse urine. And so what happened was that when you fast forward a decade, and this is 1917, what you see is the horse and buggy is gone. When something is 10 times cheaper, 10 times better, 10 times whatever, you displace it and you change. How fast did this happen? Well, in 1908, Henry Ford develops the Model T and the production line. 1908, 1912, there are more cars than horses four years later. We can adopt and adapt really fast. So hold on. So here's Waymo. They're operational right now in 25 cities. They have authorization in Arizona to run fully autonomous, no safety driver. And by the way, Uber found out that safety drivers don't actually add value. No human can go from doing nothing to being attention instantly. The AI has to be better. And these AIs, because the massive amount of data they're bringing in, will very quickly become better than any human driver. Don't start me on a 16-year-old testosterone-laden kid behind a 5,000-pound vehicle at 60 miles an hour. I'll take the AI, thank you. These vehicles have driven over 5 billion simulated miles, 5 million miles, right? But it's not just here in the United States and all the companies. It's also in China with Baidu, massive competition. The technology is coming and coming fast. 
But it's not just autonomous cars, it's flying cars, right? When Peter Thiel said we were promised flying cars and all we got is, you know, 256 characters, here we are, they're here finally. So Airbus has committed to flying taxis. Here is Bell, right? They used to be Bell Helicopter, they're now just Bell. And we see Boeing as well. At this point, by my count, a billion dollars plus a year being invested, well over 20 startups. So Uber is committed to demos in LA and Dallas by 2020, operational in LA and Dallas by 2023. And their vision of Uber Air's cost is less than an Uber X ride. So what happens to the value of real estate when I can go from my home in the countryside to downtown in minutes for less than a car drive? We're going to start to see cities spread. Where people live and where people work is going to transform. All right, here's another topic I'm passionate about, longevity. So. I have three passions. One is opening up the space frontier. The second is solving the world's grand challenges through Singular University and XPRIZE. And the third is how do we add 20 or 30 healthy years on your lives? How do we make 100 years old and you 60? So at 100, you've got the aesthetics, the cognition, and the mobility you had. So there's extraordinary technologies in the lab right now. I'm proud to be a co-founder of three companies in this area, an advisor, an investor, and a friend of a dozen others. In the next 10 years, we're likely to add a good decade. My friend Ray Kurzweil and Aubrey de Grey talk about something called longevity escape velocity, which is the notion that there's going to be a moment in time that for every year you're alive, science is extending your life for more than a year. I don't know, I've got two eight-year-old boys. The question of how long will their generation be able to live? Is it 120? We're gonna crack that code and add centuries on top of that. But one thing is for sure, as we extend lifespan, every industry transforms. My third part, I want to share with you, and then please get your questions ready, because that's my, my favorite uh, element of the keynote, is that we're heading towards a time where we have the ability to solve the world's greatest challenges. That ultimately, within the laws of physics, there is no problem we cannot solve. We may think of it as impossible, but believe me, the stuff that we do routinely today as individuals would have been considered crazy and impossible 100 years ago. Now, I grew up on the tail end of this. Hard to believe it was 50 years ago, right? The Apollo program literally was unfathomable. And it showed us what humans could do, what human intellect and passion and determination could do. It showed us what was possible right now, and then this scientific documentary showed us where the world was going. Not even a chuckle, guys? All right. Come on, any Trekkies here, please? But truly, this lit my fire. My passion was space. I wanted so badly to become an astronaut. I was one of those kids who applied to the Astronaut Corps at age nine. But then as I got to meet so many astronauts, I figured out that my chance of becoming a NASA astronaut was less than my chance of becoming an NBA All-Star at 5'5". And I committed to doing it privately. And so I started starting companies in the space business. And then I read one day about this guy, Charles Lindbergh. I learned that Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic in 1927, not on a whim, but to win a $25,000 prize. So I'm reading this book, and in this book, it talks about all the teams competing for this prize. There was this Frenchman, Raymond Ortega, born under the Pyrenees Mountains, crosses the Atlantic in 1901, penniless, becomes a busboy at the Hotel Lafayette, the hotel manager, the hotel owner, and just after World War I, which saw the first airplanes being really developed and used, he became enamored with aviation. And he offered up a prize for the first person to fly between New York and Paris, or Paris and New York, 
And the newspapers just laughed at him. It was a crazy idea. Anyone could fly that distance. But he persisted. He offered this $25,000 prize, and it turned out nine different teams spent $400,000 to try and win this guy's $25,000. And I said, that's amazing. I'm going to create a prize for private space flight. So I can build the spaceships, take me and my friends into space. So these were the rules. It was going to be a $10 million prize to attract the entrepreneurs, but not the aerospace giants. It had to be privately funded. I didn't want the government of China coming in to win it. You had to be able to carry three people, a pilot and two paying passengers, or an autopilot and three very brave passengers. You had to go to 100 kilometers altitude, land safely, and then do it again with the same ship. And incredibly, we had 26 teams from seven countries around the world who spent $100 million going after this competition. And I remember with Greg Marinak, who gave me the Spirit of the St. Louis book, we charted out what were the ways we would approach this prize. And every single approach was tried. A rocket being towed behind an airplane, below an airplane, above an airplane, a balloon first stage, a helicopter first stage, out of the water, out of the land, everything. And the team spent $100 million going after this $10 million prize. They're all optimists. And here's the winning vehicle, Spaceship One, in the Mojave on the day it flew its second flight. It was funded by Paul Allen. It was built by Burt Rutan. And our X Prize was funded by an amazing woman, Anusha Ansari, who's now the CEO of the X Prize as I serve as executive chairman. And the winning vehicle is now hanging in the Air and Space Museum right next to the Spirit of St. Louis. And Richard Branson, who turned me down twice for funding the $10 million prize, I still have a bone to pick, came in and committed a quarter of a billion dollars to commercialize the technology and build Virgin Galactic. And I'm very proud I've got one of the early tickets to fly and sort of, it's like throwing yourself a touchdown pass, right? Why am I telling you this? It's because we're living in a time when the crowd can help you solve your problems. The tools that you guys have enabling the democratization to build and solve. Maybe it's the crowd inside your company. Maybe it's your clients. Maybe it's the world. Maybe it's your university. The question is, you need to know what problem you want to solve. And if you're clear about the problem and can say, the first person to achieve this, I don't care where you went to school, ever done before, you solve this problem, you win, is incredibly powerful. You know, I'm very proud as well, uh, one of the companies we spun out of XPRIZE, HeroX, it's H-E-R-O-X.com, is a platform play that for minimal dollars, you can run a competition. You can put up a $100 HeroX challenge or a $1,000 or a Karma Prize for nothing and literally get the crowd to try and solve your problem. So how do you do that? On the heels of the X Prize being won, I was able to build an amazing board of trustees from Larry Page and Ray Kurzweil and Elon Musk and James Cameron. And as an organization, we look around and say, what is a problem that's not being solved? What is it that people don't believe is possible or there are organizations blocking the transformation? or people just think there's a stigma there and they can't do it. And so since that time, we have launched about 150 million, closer to $200 million of X prizes. Another $200 million are in development across the range. Let me just share a couple of them that have recently been won and where we're going, just to give you a sense of the power that you and your colleagues have. So uh, it was about five years ago uh, that out of our visioneering event, which is our major event of the year where we come up with prizes, one of the visioneering teams proposed the idea of a platform play to teach kids, about 250 million kids who have no access to schools and no teachers. And you can't scale teachers and schools fast enough. So we asked teams to build a piece of Android software that could be resident on a tablet or phablet and take a child in the middle of no place from complete illiteracy to reading, writing, and numeracy on their own. Elon Musk raised his hand and funded the prize. 
We had 700 teams enter, 198 delivered software, five finalists. Google gave us some 5,000 tablets. And we went out into rural Tanzania where there was nothing. We went and installed solar in 141 villages, taught the village mama how to charge the tablets, and then dropped off the tablets with one of the five finalist softwares. So all the teams together spent $300 million going after that $15 million prize. The winning software, which we announced about two weeks ago, two, final, two teams split the, the final prize. One hour of tablet use a day is the equivalent of that child being in full-time schooling in Tanzania. Right? Talk about scale, 1.3 billion Android devices manufactured per year. Here's another prize we awarded the winner last week in Monaco. We challenged teams to map the ocean floor. You know, we know more about the moon and Mars than we do our oceans because of the physics of salt water. We've mapped about 2% of the ocean floor, and the prediction was 300 years to map the other 98%. So we challenged teams, can you build an autonomous robot, no humans involved, you launch it from the shoreline, it goes out, it goes down 4,000 meters, and then it's got to map 250 square kilometers in 24 hours and bring the data back. Five finalists went head-to-head -to -head in Kalamata, Greece, and the winning team, which took home the money, has reduced the mapping time from 300 years to a decade. Right? We're talking about transformation. Here's the key point. One of the teams was a two-person team. Another team was 12 graduate students. Right? We're talking about small teams able to do extraordinary things. I love this prize. We talk about water wars and water scarcity. This was another prize that came out of our visioneering called the Water Abundance X Prize. We challenged teams, can you build a device that can pull 2,000 liters of water out of the atmosphere for two cents per liter from renewable energy in 24 hours? And they did it. Right? There are quadrillions of liters of water, and two-thirds of the Earth's surface has enough humidity to power these devices. I love this prize. It's one for all the engineers here, and registration for it is still open. So if you're interested, please consider it. In the future, I'm not physically here. I'm in Santa Monica in my pajamas. I've got a pair of VR goggles and a haptic suit on. What's on stage here is a robotic avatar. And as I walk around my living room, the robot walks around. As I look around at you, I see through the robot's eyes. I feel like I'm here. You feel like I'm here. Right? That's the challenge for this competition. It's made for all of the technologists and all of the software platforms here in the room. Registration is still open. You can go to xprize.org to find out more about it. But this is about getting you know, medical help and disaster relief just when you need it. Eventually, one of these is in your closet. And when you need to fix something or get a medical checkup, your, your you know, utility guy or, or your physician ubers into your avatar. Some final thoughts. First of all, a negative mindset will never give you a positive life. We are alive during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. There is no challenge we cannot solve. It's really about committing the passionate mind to making it happen. The second thing that I teach in my abundance community and Singularity University is that the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. Want to become a billionaire? Help a billion people. There's a beautiful alignment for that. If you'd like a copy of these slides, uh, just send an email to slides at diamandis.com. My server will send you back these slides. Please share them with your friends, your kids, your family. I put out a blog every Sunday about this. I truly believe this is the most extraordinary time ever. Enjoy it. Set your heights big. Go for your moonshots. Focus on your digital transformation because there's no other option. You're either transforming yourself or you're going out of business. Those are the rules today. An honor and pleasure, and now my favorite time, some questions. I'd love to take them. Thank you. I'm waiting for the can jacket. We, can we give another round of applause for Dr. Peter, Peter Diamandis, please? Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Seriously. Tom. Thank you. Grab a seat.
We're gonna take uh, we're gonna take a few minutes to to take some questions. Perfect. I think we also just take a collective deep breath. Can we just take a collective deep breath for a second and just transition from that? That was powerful. Just <sighs> there was a lot that you said there. I have so many questions. We don't have that much time. All right, we're gonna start first. We're gonna get into this rapid fire so that we can also take any questions coming on Twitter. Uh, Dr. Diamandis said that he would be open to that, so shoot him, and I'll try to grab them and get them in. I'm going to start first with, uh, how does someone keep up with this exponential rate of change? You talk a lot about not just change, but exponential rate of change. Yeah. What's the mindset that they need to have? So, uh, really important question, and I think part of it is you're here uh, for that reason. Uh, Again, I mentioned early on that we have a local and linear brain. That's the way our wiring is. That's the way our brains evolved. So we innately think linearly. We make things look linear. Yeah. And the only way I know to keep up is constantly to be updating yourself. It's now this is now possible in AI. Now this is possible in AR or VR. So it is, it's continuous education. It used to be, I mean, education in the past was, uh, you know, the average lifespan 100 years ago, 1901, thereabouts, was 40. So you'd go to college, you'd be graduated by 22, right. and you, your education will last you 18 years, right. and during which nothing really changed. That's right. But today, it's very different. So it's continuous education. But, but neurologically, we're wired to protect ourselves. We are. We're, we're wired to, to stay in a comfort zone. Yeah, I call and CNN the Crisis News Network or the Constantly Negative News. <laughs> I haven't got a good, good acronym for Fox. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the challenge is that we're bombarded by negative news, right? Because, not blaming you, but no, no. that's because the news media wants our eyeballs. And we pay 10 times more attention to negative news than positive news. And it's not that they're, you know, it's 10 to 1 negative to positive in the world. There's amazing uh, positive news. Right, right. Amazing. It just open up the newspaper tomorrow morning and count the number of negative stories to positive stories. It's 10 to 1. So when you're bombarded by so much negativity, so mindset is really important. Yeah. So I talk about an abundance mindset, an exponential right. mindset. Right, right. You know, whether it's through live works or Singular University or Abundance Digital or whatever it might be, how do you keep that alive in your life? Constantly, every day. That's the, and that's really what I was going with that too. And I think you know you're pointing out curiosity, remaining curious, which means you'll continue to evolve and you'll continue to educate yourself. At, at, let me just let me hit on that because it's a great point. Every one of us needs to have what I call your massively transformative purpose. What's your passion and your purpose in life? You know, what do you wake up with in the morning excited about, and what do you go to sleep at night excited about? Mm. It may not be aligned with your job. Right. But it may be something much bigger than you. And when you've got that passion and purpose, it gives you a north star of curiosity. Yes, so that, you know, my passion and purpose early on was 150,000% space. It then moved to, you know, solving grand challenges, longevity. But when I see a technology, all the technologies on the floor here, how do I use that for my passion? How do I use that to solve? It gives you uh, a reason to be constantly curious, to right. your point. Yeah, and that creates comprehension. You it know, does. And understand. And, and, and personalization and meaning. Yeah, that's true. You know, I often say that uh, relevancy creates urgency. And what I'm hearing from you is the more we can look at things that are happening around us or to us or, or uh, beside us, if we can understand what and have the clarity of our purpose, we can figure out ways that now we can make that relevant to us, which then now makes it something that's more urgent to us than maybe it would have been before. But that's a different lens that it, you're talking about having on, 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 on life and on society and on the problems that we're facing. So what is your massively transformative purpose? What is your moonshot? Inside your organization, inside your philanthropy, whatever it might be, that level of energy that wakes you up in the morning, keeps you going at night, it's going to actually, it's one of the major drivers of longevity. It's going to keep you alive longer. Mm. It's going to keep you more vibrant. People love to be with people who have got passion and purpose. This is true. The power of that energy does connect. So if you don't have your MTP and your moonshot, please find it. So one of the things that comes up with this then, and you mentioned this, like getting the crowd to get involved can also help you with everything from identifying your massively transformative pro uh, passion yeah. to, to figuring out how you're going to solve a problem. If you don't have the clarity, that was really important that you picked up. It's like, yeah, we can all know to go after our purpose, but how do we get the clarity of the problem that we're trying to solve or the purpose that we're trying to reach? Are there any techniques or yeah. ideas or thoughts that come to mind around Sure, great question. So I differentiate your 
your, your MTP, your Masculine Transformer to Purpose from your moonshots, your MTP is got to have an emotional charge. Mm. It's something that you're awe-inspired by, you're like uh. amazed by, or something you just, an injustice, I'm going to it's solve it. It's, 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 it's got to be something that drives you emotionally. If it's not something that you're energized by or awed or pissed off about, right. you're, it's not going to be sufficient. So your, your MTP is in that area. And then your moonshot, if your MTP is your canvas, okay. your moonshot is a specific measurable goal. Uh on that. Okay. I am going to, so for me, my MTP was opening up space commercially. My first moonshot was, I'm going to cause the development of suborbital vehicles. Three person, 100 kilometers, mm -hmm. twice, in, very concrete measurable goals that I know when I achieve it. Yes. Yeah, that's very specific. Yeah. Uh, and I love the fact that you're saying th that this is a transformative purpose that it's not just finding your purpose. We hear that often, I even preach, look, I have a shirt on right now, dream, create, go. Well, you gotta know what you're dreaming about and what you wanna create in order to even go. I just wanna give people permission to dream bigger than they ever have, yeah. because the tools we have are extraordinary these days. So you talked about, and Eric Snow tweeted, every company needs a crazy idea department to capture exponential growth. Too many organizations that I see or counsel or advise, they operate in a state of fear. Uh, and so how do we get people to uh, give them the permission to fail, yeah. so to speak, which to me, there is no, no such thing as failing unless you don't try. You, you either get the outcome that you were looking for or you learn from it, but unless you don't try, then you actually fail. So how do we get people to get to that permission mindset of attempting risk and being okay with that? So I, I spend a lot of time on that. I have a group of 400 CEOs that I, uh, that I coach and mentor for a 25-year journey. Mm. Um, every that's, January that's called deep. Abundance 360. Yeah. And um, uh, we talk a lot about how do you do this? Because it's hard. Every company has an immune system. Right. And that immune Good system point. will attack anything disruptively mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. So first of all, it's, it's getting the, the leadership team on board. But then you need board coverage on top of that right. to give the CEO permission to take that's crazy right. ideas. That's Otherwise, right. you know. It all falls apart. And then on top of that, a lot of the disruptive change needs to be outside of the walls of the organization. So when Steve Jobs went after the Mac, you know, he took his entire team, put it in a separate building, and put a pirate flag on top and said, stay away. I mean, literally. And so it's go, and I've done that myself. When we, when we spun out Hero X from XPRIZE, we did it up in Vancouver, and we're based in LA. And so a lot of times a disruptive idea, just the team will react negatively, but of course, there are very few 100-year-old companies. Everybody's core product eventually goes to zero. And it's really the investments on the edge that you make mm. that will eventually grow. And you want to you leverage those investments on the edge, those startups on the edge. When I think about abundance, I think about your book, Bold, I think about the future, that to me triggers next generation and the generations below that. How do we as adults, as parents, as caregivers, start to speak in a way that our children can understand what they're stepping into and potentially be pre better prepared for it? So a great question. I, uh, I wrote a, a white paper last year, or, my, or two years ago when I was, my kids were going into elementary school, because I was like, the system that we have right now is so, you know, last century, mm -hmm. right? It right. was built for a factory age where right. the bell rings and the kids <laughs> move stations. <laughs> And they, they're taught to an exam to create exactly what society needed, which was factory workers and so forth. They're very different than today. And I don't know about you guys, when's the last time you factored a polynomial? <laughs> uh, it's been a while, right? So, but we don't teach what I think is important, which is, so I, for me, there are three things for me, for my kids that I think is very important. Number one is help them find their passion. Because my passion was my single greatest, you know, uh, God-given source. That it drove me to do everything I did. And I, and, Right now, their passion is Minecraft and Roblox, mm. right? <laughs> but honestly, I think that's a future of virtual worlds we're moving into. Sure. So what am I to say about this? The second thing is trying to teach them the importance of asking great questions. Mm. It's not what you know anymore. It's the quality of the question you ask. So in the boardroom or the C-suite or in elementary school, it's the same thing. Ask great questions. And the third thing uh, that for me I'm trying to work, teach my kids is grit not ever giving up. Right? A lot of my 
successes have been overnight successes after 10 or 11 years of hard work. <laughs> That's so true. Resiliency. Yeah. Resiliency is so critical. And the only way you can do that is you have to actually know what it feels like to fall down. So in order to the, get back up. Along the failure, so uh, Astro Teller, who used to run Google X, he now runs X, is a friend. He comes and participates in our, in our programs. And, uh, and at Google X, I'll call it Google X because I have a hard time calling it just X, but uh, he talks about they have a Friday afternoon meeting. And he has hundreds of teams and startup modes and so forth. And he asks the question, are any teams here uh, going to fail themselves today? And a team raises their hand and says, uh, we're failing our company today. We're stopping it. And instead of people being pissed, everyone cheers, <laughs> gets up, yeah, fantastic. It's because they've determined that their product or service isn't going to cut it. And instead of just continuing to preserve the money and the time they've invested, they kill it yeah. there and right. take the scarce resource of their people. And they do something called pre-mortems. Uh. <laughs> and said, okay, the, here's the mental question. If your product or service, if a year from now, you came back in your time machine and said, listen, a year from now, the product or service we were developing died an awful death. Ask yourself the question, why would it have died? Mm. Come up with a list of all the reasons it could have died. Yep. And then if there's a really good one, maybe you should be killing it. Right. Now, you know, Intuit has what they call failure parties. And these are exactly. cele celebration moments for trying things that didn't turn into other products. And they actually give awards for this. So it's a celebratory atmosphere. You have to encourage risk. Yeah. It's hard, it's, it's easier to say and really hard to do. It is. Uh, Kathy Hackle, who I do know, is here and uh, she speaks on this spatial computing and virtual reality. She says, thank you, Peter Diamandis. You made me realize how lucky I am to do what I do and work toward building the future. And, I, and uh, spatial computing, Web 3.0, I mean, amazing, right? Talk about the transformation of education, advertising, retail, everything we know. The world is about to come alive yeah, it is. in a, a way that way. we don't conceive. Yeah. Are those AR glasses? No. Are they look, they, cool they look like it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, we have a question here. Please share some of the advancements in solving world hunger. Sure. So we're getting ready to launch a series of X prizes in uh, two areas. One is cellular meats. So here's, here's what's going on. 93 million miles away, the sun in the fusion reactor generates photons that come, and like one in a billion photons gets captured by plants and converted to... Uh, uh, to carbohydrates, and then a cow comes over and eats that, and then you sacrifice a cow to get the meat. But it's a massively inefficient process. You build the entire cow to get a steak. And <laughs> right. a third of our non-ice landmass is used for livestock. And a, a large amount, I remember the number of our, of our grains are used to feed livestock. So it's a very inefficient process. And as we create more and more abundance in the world, more and more people want to move up the food protein chain and get to beef and pork and fish and tuna and so forth, we can't feed them the same way. It's destroying our planet. And the technology now exists, and we want to do this at massive scale, to take a stem cell muscle biopsy from uh, a Wagyu beef uh, cow mm -hmm. and then grow those cells in the lab at scale. Much cheaper much less CO2 output, much less land, much less water, much less energy, and scalable massively. Mm. And manufacturable in MENA, in Asia, wherever you need it. So that's a vision of the future yeah. that we're heading towards. The other is downtown vertical farming and other, and other mechanisms. Yep. But we have to transform how we manufacture food, and not just food, Great tasting food, healthier sure. food. Not has to be as good; it has to be better yeah. for us. I mean, just look at the Impossible Burger right now. Amazing! And going and I love that team. Yeah. yeah, and it's a great team, and it's a great burger, by the way. All right, we're going to wrap. We're going to wrap thoughts. I'm going to do this really quick for yeah. you because I do want to get Lucian's question. He says, "How do you teach people the skill set of asking great questions?" So it's practice. It's literally forcing your team to each ask questions. There are no bad questions, right? Again, crazy questions. I mean, I I, I can't. It's like. Somebody at one of the hotel chains is kicking themselves for not creating Airbnb, right? Or the taxi companies for not creating Uber or Lyft. It's because they didn't ask the question. So what are crazy questions that you can ask? And there are no bad questions. Because somewhere in that question is an aha moment. And in this time where technology is making us all more powerful and science fiction is becoming science fact, yeah. it's awesome. And one of the things that I take away from this, among many, was that, it was especially when you look at that chart of the businesses and the ideas and the things that have gone away, 
ego. If people could get out of their own way sometimes, they could ask great questions yeah. and they'd find better answers. Questioning, not defending. Quest oh, questioning, not defending. That's a tweetable right there. Can we give Dr. Peter Diamandis another round of applause, please? Really, it's empowering. Yes, absolutely, man. It's a pleasure meeting you. Give me a hug, brother.